Hey everybody, welcome back. Let's keep going with machine learning. Just throw ourselves right in, okay? There is a, a little recap to just see where we've been so far with machine learning. So we've talked about the, the four big things that we're gonna do with machine learning. We have to partition our data. We have to select models and features and we have to assess the model that we build and find out if it's any good. We've also talked about the different big flavors of machine learning, supervised versus unsupervised machine learning. Okay, um, actually I'm not agreeing with my slide here. You know, uh, neural nets and deep learning are not necessarily unsupervised. They can be, as we talked about last time, semi-supervised or completely supervised as well. So things I would include here are things like uh, clustering algorithms and things like that. So we've already talked about some examples like the decision tree learning of San Francisco versus New York City. Um, and we're gonna do a couple more of these examples, all right? So, um, right, so we're going to talk about Airbnb photos and looking at your future success using a more advanced decision tree. Um, so I should also say that, uh, you know, things, just because something is a buzzword now and every Silicon Valley startup is doing something with deep learning, doesn't mean that other kinds of machine learning algorithms are dead or obsolete, all right? As we said at the end of the last time, there are uh, use cases where you might really not want deep learning. If you don't have internet sized data, it's useless. If you uh, don't, you know, if you want some sort of interpretability to understand why it's making a decision, deep learning is not as good as many other machine learning algorithms, okay? So, and it is important to understand that deep learning can easily go wrong. Um, here's a little tweet from last year uh, where it looks like there was this automatic, you know, AI algorithm that was going to decide what you should get on your credit card limit. And the wife has uh, got the higher credit score, but she's got much less than the husband's credit limit. Um, so clearly there is some weird things going on. It can't possibly be the algorithm, say the people who make it. So of course it is, okay? Spoiler alert. So things can go wrong when you use algorithms incorrectly, whether that's a deep learning network or a regular machine learning network, or even just statistical regression. <laughs> so, Let's do an example, a worked example. We're gonna categorize the listing photos for Airbnb. What do you think that should be, right? Would it be regression or classification, clustering, dimensionality reduction? What I'm talking about is something like the task is, uh, we wanna know are these photos of the kitchen or the living room? Are they photos of the uh, the outside of the building, right? So think to yourself, make a decision. I am not gonna run up a Google form again, just because, again, this is kind of a quick quickie, not something that really is important. So uh, there is a nice little article that you can read if you wanna get into this, because we're just gonna use an example system that exists. We wanna do this for, uh, oh, by the way, the answer to that was clearly uh, supervised classification, right? Potentially clustering, but again, just like the last one, it's gonna be harder to take that approach, right? So the case for why we wanna do this, we would like to have people, you know, optimize their experience on Airbnb. We want to make sure that the same room type can be grouped together, right? When somebody puts up their listing, maybe they throw a bunch of photos up willy-nilly, we would like to group all the kitchen photos together for a better user experience, okay? 
We'd also like to maybe double check that the person listing the Airbnb is not lying about how many rooms, okay, etc. So why can't we just type what people what people why can't we just trust what people typed in, right? That's because people don't use the language very consistently and the language is too flexible for this, right? This might say bedroom, but uh, the view from the bedroom is not the same thing as just using the tag bedroom. Um, clearly, the swimming pool is not visible in this photo, etc., etc. Okay, so how can we get some labeled training data? All right, we could ask some number of listers to do it for us and get some random sampling. Uh, or we can use those image capture those image captions that we do have and try to figure out how to extract labels out of it. Okay. It could be hard, but let's see if we can do it. We're going to try to do it with our good old friend ResNet 50. Okay. So we have got if we train it on a set of labeled data where somebody has gone through and uh, used some large amounts of time and effort to accurately label things, then our system can go ahead and reach quite high levels of performance, okay? This is a precision recall curve. So what this says is that um, as we are doing better and better at catching every single instance of the bedroom, we're not getting any problems with accidentally missing, uh, you know, misclassifying things that are not bedrooms as bedrooms. Okay, so this is things that go bend out close to this are close to perfect performance. Okay, so we do pretty well overall with ResNet 50 on classifying bedrooms or living rooms. So just FYI, if the system was bad at classifying, we would see a steep drop early on in its precision, its ability to get every single one of the, of the bedrooms. Sorry, its ability to not get things that were not bedrooms versus its ability to get every single one of the bedrooms in recall. Okay. So the left two photos here were correctly predicted as bedrooms. The right two were correctly predicted as not bedrooms. Okay? So good examples look good. And these are not swimming pools, interestingly. And that is pretty good job given the commonalities there. So. All right, let's do a different worked example. Can we predict who in this course will be a good, successful data scientist in the future? All right? So what kind of machine learning task is this? Yeah, it's still classification supervised. You're right. Okay. Well, how can we predict your success? We need a bunch of inputs, a bunch of features that we can work with. So we have things like your names and survey information. We have demographic knowledge of you, what, your, what race you identified as, background knowledge and interests, what skill sets you had coming into the course, right? That kind of thing. I click a responses and your grades, all right? So what data would you use to predict future success and why? And almost more importantly, what data would you not use, right? There's a bunch of this data in here and it's possible that if we used it incorrectly, we could come up with a uh, prediction, but it would not generalize to new data. All right. 
So we want to build a model that predicts data science success. So we've got some arbitrary label. You are yes or no successful. And we've got all this kind of information about whether you had a pet, how many siblings you had, you know, your height, that kind of thing. And of course, maybe things that might actually matter down here, right? Like your grade. All right, so we have assumedly some data with uh, past students and we know they're quote successful or not. Let's ignore exactly what that means. All right, and we can take all this data. We've got 186 students from three years ago. Let's try to figure it out. What are we going to do? Well, first off, we're going to split the data up like we've talked about. We need a, t a training set that's going to be used for building the model. And then we're going to need a test set to find out, is the model any good? Data we use to train the model is not used to test the model. So we have to split it up. So we're going to use 80% of the data to train and we're going to use 20% of the data to test, right? And what we're going to do is we're going to randomly assign data points. We're not going to take the first 80% of them and the last 20. Because what if, I mean, you know, what if for some reason we have, uh, you know, we come to decide that the, uh, the last name is important for predicting success, okay? So you're not going to get all the Z's in by taking the last, uh, you know, the, the last 20% off the data and using it for testing. You're not going to have any Z names for training the model. Okay. We want to randomly assign data points to either the training set or the test set. Okay. So we're going to use these features and we're going to build a model that predicts success. All right, here's our model. This bar tells you how much influence one of these variables had on predicting success, okay? So what that means is programming skill was very important for deciding whether somebody was successful or not, okay? So it was height and this grade and your college uh, RE and, you know, whether you like stats or not, your year in school, okay? All these things are clearly more important over here and clearly less important over there. Okay, so we've trained the model up on the 150. Now we wanna test it on the 36. So we're gonna take a look at that predicted success, we're going to fill it up. We're going to fill up this little box to say, how is the model doing? Okay, how would you fill up that box? Which ones of these scores would you use to better understand the successful performance or not of a classifier? So I can tell you, have you, have you thought it out yet? Anybody have an answer? Liam Neeson. Okay, you're right, Liam. Yeah, we're not gonna do that. That's for regressions, not for classification. We also, I, I have to tell you that this is not right either because we probably have some relatively imbalanced sets of data with maybe fewer successes or fewer failures, right? So we, we want to do something a little bit better. We want something over in this range, okay? If your model is as accurate as a random guess, how accurate would that be, right? The idea is that we want to do better than random chance. How good is random chance? We got to know that to know if we do better. Anybody? Bueller? Bueller? All right, Bueller. Yes, you're right, 50%. That is 
this is a binary classification task. You're either successful or you're not. Therefore, doing randomly is going to be 50%. All right, let's fill up our assessment box. We're going to use accuracy, but what's more important is sensitivity and specificity. Okay, accuracy is um, what percent were correctly predicted and sensitivity and specificity are what percent uh, that those that were successes were predicted correctly to be success and specificity is of those that were failures what percent were correctly predicted not to succeed okay these are your ratios of um, true positives over true positives plus true negatives. No, false positives, sorry. And specificity is the same thing, but for negatives. Okay. So let's take a look at the training set. When we were the 150 that we were trained on, we get 70 two-ish percent accurate, 66 percent sensitivity, right? 66 percent sensitivity that means that of the troop of the things that actually we predicted to be positive, that were actually positive, 66 percent of them we predicted correctly. All right, and we're a little better with the uh, the false negative problem. So 78 percent of those people who were not successful we correctly predicted as being not successful. Okay, what happens with our test set? It's a lot worse. In fact, we are trash for sensitivity, and we're actually even below chance levels, right? So the chance level is 50%. We actually randomly fell below that. So this model does not generalize well. All right, so what if I decide to add some extra features? Maybe that will help the situation, okay? Well, now it turns out that if you add in height and gender, then we have like really big importance. Huh, why is gender such an important factor in predicting success? Does anybody have any ideas? Wow. If we use this model, it turns out we get 100% accuracy on everything. Do you think that's a good prediction? Why would this be a bad prediction? Right? Well, it seems quite likely that there is something wrong with using gender to predict success. It might actually reflect a uh, structural problem, right? Where only dudes get hired for jobs with other dudes, right? Sorry, cat, only humans get hired for jobs, not cats. So um, what if I was using this kind of a data to determine who I should write recommendation letters for? or determine which students I wanted to give my attention to, right? Or projects that I read, or who I helped out extra, right? So if it happens that in the past only dudes were hired as programmers, and in the future we would like to have that change, using our past history to determine our future actions would obviously prevent that. And just because we've stitched it up and stuck it inside a machine learning algorithm doesn't make that kind of structural sexism any better or easier to stomach, okay? People will argue that the algorithm is unbiased. Well, maybe not, okay? The algorithm isn't itself a sexist, but it's trained on sexist data. So when models are trained on historical data, predictions will, per will perpetuate these biases. So here's an example. 
um, so Dare Obsanjo, he uh, he mentioned this great little thing where uh, you know various problems that Amazon and Google had had with hiring using automatic AI algorithms uh, had turned out to be racist and sexist. Okay, this got uh, a lot of press, including by uh, uh, Congressperson Ocasio Cortez. So uh, what happened here? Well, these, so in the case of the racist event, it turned out that Google was suggesting background checks every time somebody searched for a black sounding name, like say Dare Obasanjo, right? Then Google would serve up ads for background checks way more commonly than if somebody searched for a white sounding name like Joe Smith. All right. Why? What happened there? Well, it happened because people were using Google searching for black sounding names, clicked on randomly placed banner ads for background checks more commonly than people who had just searched for white sounding names. So maybe somebody is a landlord. They wanted to, or they're about to rent something out and they try to Google the prospective tenant. And when they see nothing and they see an ad for a background check service, you know, something in them that's a little bit racist makes it a little bit more likely they're gonna click on that ad if it's a black person they're searching for rather than a white person. Then Google took that input data and they ran with it, right? There's just the algorithm. It noticed that black names mean you should serve more background check ads because that's what Google does. It's an ad serving machine. They want you to click, all right? So that was pretty bad. Um, and it's, you know, not per se the algorithm, but it's the data that uses that the algorithm gets trained with. The algorithm is contaminated by our history. So Amazon had a similar problem where they tried to uh, train up an AI to help sort through the massive amounts of resumes that Amazon was getting. Well, the algorithm didn't like women. Can you guess why? Because most of the employees at Amazon had hired in the past were dudes. And it turned out that even highly qualified women were getting rejected by this algorithm. Okay. So here's what we have to do to deal with that, right? We have to anticipate and plan for potential biases when we make the model. And we also have to check afterwards, right? To find out if we still messed up. Um, we also need to just make sure we revisit and update things, right? You know, sometimes circumstances change and you have to update to newest data, different trends. And that can help take care of some of it, but it can also, of course, create new opportunities for new problems. <laughs> okay. And most importantly, though, is for you as a practitioner to have an ethical viewpoint. Bullet points two and four are about you and how you want to use your skills. All right. Well, thank you very much for uh, having a little machine learning session with us. I hope that you enjoyed these. Um, we will obviously be happy to answer more questions about machine learning, chat with you as you might be uh, in a position during your, uh, your final project to apply any of this stuff. We can help you do it right with the right kinds of data partitioning to make sure you've got training and testing set separate, how to apply feature selection and model selection, finding the right kinds of models for your tasks and the right kinds of features to make those models work right, and how to assess it all at the end. All right, everybody, have fun. Bye.